last one, so I um, hope you didn't miss me too much. I'm sure you didn't. I heard Jim Green gave a great talk, and I, I'm kind of, I watched a little bit of it. I was in, uh, I was in a different continent, but I managed to see some of it uh, through the, the, the wonders of the web. So um, this is the last lecture of this semester. We have some plans afoot, which I think will be kind of fun for next semester, but I won't spoil anything yet. We are hoping to get Thomas Obukin back. If you remember, uh, he was our, our scheduled speaker for October. Um, the vice president decided he needed them more than we needed them and took him to Denver with him, and so he had to cancel on us, but he did promise he would come back. Right now, we have him scheduled for January 25th, but that may change. He's, a, he's an important person, and his schedule is dictated by other people. So, um, but Thomas will be back at some point in the, in the semester, hopefully in, hopefully in January. Um, it's, anybody know what today is? My accent is a hint. <laughs> it's St. Andrew's Day. We used to get a school holiday for that, but not anymore. So, Patron Saint of Scotland, um, November 30th. So, the beer was on me, which hopefully you'll take advantage of it. <laughs> so, um, anyway, one, this year has been a really interesting year from the perspective of space anniversaries, uh, Sputnik anniversary and Apollo 17 anniversary, um, there was another one, and I'm going to boast to everybody here because most of this audience will know who this person is. Everybody know who Valentina Tereshkova is? First Soviet astronaut woman. I actually got to meet her. Um, that's why I wasn't here the last time, so I got to meet Valentina, which was just absolute first woman ever to be in space. She went into space even before I was born, but she still could probably kick my butt from here to next week. Um, <laughs> Really interesting person. So that was a, a real thrill for me. So that's my boasting over. Um, so a lot of anniversaries this year. And one of the ones that is kind of exciting for me was Voyager. Because when I was um, a brand new teenager, Voyager was sending pictures back from uh, some of the most exotic places in the solar system. And so I've kind of, as an astronomer, I've kind of grown up with this notion that Voyager uh, was the kind of thing that got me started. And so this year, as you know, is the 40th anniversary um, of the, the launch of the Voyager spacecraft. And we're fortunate, living where we do, to have um, some really good people nearby who are heavily involved with the instrument. So that allows me to segue into my introduction. Um, tonight's speaker uh, describes himself as a space groupie. And he has been, I think most of you will resonate with that, he has been since the Gemini days in the mid-60s. But he actually got his first formal introduction to the planetary sciences, which has been um, his, his work since then, um, when he was a NASA planetary geology summer intern um, at JPL. And this was during the Voyager 2 encounter, um, I presume with Jupiter, the Jupiter encounter. Um, and because of that experience as an intern, he's been very active in promoting internships um, in the sciences and, and uh, in the space in general. Um, so he's a, an advisor for the Lunar Planetary Institute summer intern program. Undergraduates who are out there who are interested, you can talk to him later. Um, Paul has his PhD from Washington University in St. Louis uh, under uh, Bill McKinnon. Um, he arrived at LPI in 1991 and he's been working on Voyager, Galileo, Cassini, uh, with the, the, the imaging systems on there, basically to map the topography and the geology of these icy outer planets. Um, he says he's dabbled a little bit of it in the Moon and Mars, um, which is uh, a, an increasingly interesting topic these days too. He's the author of the Atlas of the Galilean Satellites, and he's also, since uh, in the last few years, he's a scientist on the Dawn mission, which visited an asteroid, on Cassini, which we've heard a lot about. There's another anniversary for Cassini this year, or... The demise of Anna Cassini was this year. Um, and he's been studying the impact creating of small bodies and plume de de deposition processes on Enceladus. And so there's a lot of this outer solar system stuff. This is your man. And so please join me in welcoming tonight's speaker, Paul Shen. Did he mention New Horizons and Pluto? I don't remember. Say that again? Did you mention New Horizons and Pluto? Oh! And Paul was going to mention New Horizons and Pluto. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, think of the outer so. solar system and all these missions and think of Paul. 
Boy, humans really do like anniversaries, don't they? It's one of those years. So I have to ask, how many of you were here on this planet in 1989? How many of you are, how many of you are old enough to remember Voyager? Most of you are good. Okay, very good. Uh, so as the slide says, that decade or that 12-year period was actually turned out to be pretty important in human history, or at least human knowledge and awareness of their uh, surroundings, the solar system in this case. Uh, but perhaps Voyager did something a little bit more than that. Now, uh, this is going to be sort of a retrospective and sort of a personal, personal perspective. Uh, and there'll be some science thrown in, and there's no equations, I promise you. But let's start off with the story. And the story starts out in 1966, although actually technically the story starts with Galileo in 1610 when the Galilean satellites were discovered. Uh, although technically Jupiter itself and Saturn were known to the ancients. But in any case, uh, as planetary systems, these were discovered in 1610 by Galileo. The exploration of those systems began in earnest in around 1966 when a young graduate student at Caltech was asked to formulate trajectories to the outer solar system. And in that time, we hadn't even landed on the moon yet. And we had just soft landed on the moon uh, with, with automated uh, spacecraft. And he found that if you waited just long enough, uh, in a time period in the early 1980s, all four of the giant planets, Jupiter out through Neptune, and also Pluto, as it turned out, will all be on one side of the sun. And this alignment, because of the rotation periods of the four planets, only happens once every 173 years, so you have to go back to Thomas Jefferson to, to see the previous one. And it was one of those things that was just uniquely timed that we had the capability, or with a little bit of additional development, uh, to do it and that capability be ready just in time. Uh, but as the way NASA usually works is the grand idea is put forward and uh, the powers that be say, oh, uh, this is too expensive. Uh, and they say, no, you can't do that. Come back to us with a smaller idea. And you have to ask yourself how much is too expensive. This idea was to send four highly automated, self-reliant uh, probes that would require a lot of development uh, to the four planets, the four giant planets and Pluto, and New Horizons comes into this later on, uh, on two trajectories, and you see those trajectories up here, and those trajectories, of course, were not flown exactly, uh, but they're flown actually pretty closely with the exception of Pluto. In 1972, NASA approved a much more reduced uh, concept, which was to send two um, pretty advanced, although not as advanced as the Grand Tour idea, uh, two spacecraft on two separate trajectories uh, to the four giant planets. And it was called Mariner Jupiter Saturn in those days because the planetary probes were called the Mariner program. And uh, what happened was that uh, Jupiter and Saturn were authorized. You could go there. And only if you, the mission was successful and there were some technical problems on the way, uh, which we can talk about later. Uh, only if you were successful there could one of them go to Uranus and Neptune. And, and as it turned out, we, we got there, but it was eh, kind of shaky at times. Uh, and you see a newspaper clipping. This is from my groupie days. I collected newspaper clippings of all the space missions of those days, and that's one of those. And that was in the days when they had newspapers, and that was something that occurred on a, a paid sheet of, 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 of uh, wood pulp with lettering on it. <laughs> as delivered to your home. I mean, you know, this is a weird time, I'm telling you. Um, I don't even know if they delivered newspapers to homes anymore. But anyway, um, before Voyager got there, actually, there was something called Pioneer 10 and 11. Pioneer 10 and 11 were sent ahead uh, in, launched in 1972 and 73, to scout out the outer solar system and find out whether it was safe. No spacecraft had ever been past Mars as of 1972. So there was, oh, or is it going to get you know, crushed by the asteroids or, you know, or, the you know, or would the radiation belts around Jupiter destroy it? And we didn't know, of course, you know, we now know, of course, that 
the asteroid belt is very sparsely populated and the chances of hitting anything are like 0.00001 or even less than that. But in any case, what we didn't know, Pioneer uh, was an interesting little spacecraft, uh, uh, plucky, you know, courageous and all that sort of thing. Um, but it didn't have a lot of high-powered instruments. This was uh, done very cheaply. I don't even remember what the budget was in those days. And, and this is an example of one of the photographs <laughs> that Pioneer returned. Glorious and wonderful, uh, but not a lot of detail. And those of you who have followed Juno, uh, which is the orbiter around Jupiter right now, you see some of these spectacular images that they've returned of the swirling cloud decks and thunderstorm heads and all sorts of fun things that they're seeing. Well, Pioneer uh, scattered out, was primarily to scout out the radiation belts is what it was really designed to do. So it didn't really get very much uh, in terms of, of the planet so much, but it did see a few things, and these were the best views of the four Galilean satellites, the four that were discovered by Galileo. They're all planet-sized or moon-sized, so they're substantial objects, but Pioneer didn't have a high-powered camera on board, so it couldn't really tell us very much about what was going on on those bodies. Now, uh, launch, uh, in the meantime, Voyager was constructed and built and then put on the launch pad. So there were two spacecraft that were launched in the summer of 1977, hence the 40th anniversary, which is what we're celebrating today, or this, this year, sorry. Uh, but it's useful, I think, to think back about what we perceived uh, about the solar system in those days. And again, I forgot to bring it, but I've got this classic book from 1960 called All About the Planets. It was for children, uh, grade school people, and uh, grade school kids, that sort of thing. And there was you know, line drawings and that sort of stuff. And they had like one paragraph on the Galilean satellites and like two pages on Jupiter. And it's like, there's very cryptic comments. And it's like, the, the, the solar system in those days was a very sedate, stately place. All the planets went around in orbits, nothing changed. Maybe a stray comet came through. That was about it. Nothing much dramatic happened out there. And this, uh, which I think is from the uh, Hale Telescope, I think, in uh, California, I believe, uh, shows uh, there's cloud decks on Jupiter and, and all that. Even more interesting is the concept. This is an actual Voyager uh, press release, if you will, uh, to sort of wet the public's interest in terms of seeing, well, what kind of things are we going to see at Jupiter? And this shows the concepts of, uh, best concepts of what those satellites look like and how they compared in size to the moon and, and other bodies and stuff like that. And you can see, uh, like Ganymede, which is the top middle section, showing us these triangular icebergs floating around in a giant global sea. And actually it was um, kind of prescient in a certain sort of way, but it's not really accurate. Um, Again, we look very much different than the first Europa and, and the other ones uh, are all out there. So uh, March 1979 got there, and one of the things that, that Voyager had, of course, was a camera, a telescopic camera. And it returned all sorts of exquisite photographs. And because it was going through on a trajectory that was a one-way trajectory through the solar system, basically it looked like a boomerang going through, in and out on a hyper, I guess it was a hyperbolic trajectory, um, it had one shot through, this, through the Jupiter system, but as a, it approached, it could take continuous photography of Jupiter. And you can see this is an example. How, I have another example later on, uh, which is even more dramatic than this. This movie was actually reconstructed in the past five years or so by what we call amateur scientists. There's a group of people out there who are really kind of like the current space groupies. And they will go through the, the archives of the raw images and reassemble them because people like me, we don't have time to do that. There are thousands of photographs that actually go into making these movies. And they will go and do that. They, and they'll just plow through them and reassemble them and, and do the proper color stretches. And that's somebody has actually done that. It's a really spectacular job that they've done. Uh, and they do this all the time. It's just, I'm glad somebody has the time to do that. Uh, the big thing, though, was, of course, uh, uh, Voyager, remember those images I showed in the previous slide, the cryptic you know, crayon drawings of, of the Galilean satellites? This is an example on the right of what Voyager saw with a color tone uh, applied to it. And you see this big umbrella sticking out of the side of the limb, and that's an actual erupting volcano on, on Io. Uh, Io, the, 
the, the three outer Galilean satellites are all ice covered. Io is not. It's dry, it's got uh, some sort of silicates on it, and it's also got sulfur on it. But it found active volcanoes, the first place anywhere other than Earth that we had seen it. We've seen volcanoes on Mars, uh, uh, even a couple on the moon, but they're dead, you know, nothing's happening. Just, you know, it's long, long, long since uh, uh, gone into the, what's the word, extinct, the, the volcanoes are extinct, but on, the, on Io there were about 20 active volcanoes, all venting huge amounts of sulfur and sulfur dioxide into, into space. That was revolutionary. Uh, and we also saw tectonics on Ganymede and, and other things which were quite interesting we did not expect to see. Enter uh, July 1979, about four months later, Voyager 2. The second spacecraft passed through uh, Jupiter. And around the time of uh, Voyager 1, which was in March, I got a letter. I had applied uh, to a NASA internship program, and I got the letter, and I still have that letter today. It's nice and pristine. It hasn't been crinkled or anything like that. It's, it's like coming, came out of the vault almost. Um, it's probably my most prized possession, actually. Um, and there you see on the upper left, is, is me, and the person in front of me, uh, who's looking quizzically to the side, is Dr. Ed Stone, who's the project scientist, one of the smartest people on the planet. And he was in charge of 11, uh, I said 12 earlier today, but it's actually 11 prima donnas and their instruments, keeping them from killing each other, trying to get time to observe the planets. And they all did a really good job. They were dedicated to the task, but he had to keep them all in line and make sure that uh, everybody had a fair share, and he did a great job on that. But that's me as a lowly intern standing behind him in the daily briefing that we had every morning to go over the results of the previous downloads of data uh, on the previous day. That was part of the routine back then, and several of the people in the, in the foreground are, are actual uh, team leaders for the various instruments. And of course, um, in those days we didn't have cell phones, uh, so I only have one selfie from the time period, and it was actually taken by somebody else. Uh, so, um, and the color is horribly faded. It's on an organic material called a print. Uh, so um, the color is going bad, but I managed to restore it. So it's kind of cool. So I, I found that actually last week. It had been lost for a couple months. But anyway, so you might ask, what did I do as an intern? Did I do science? Did I discover great other volcanoes? No. I was immediately introduced to the copy machine. <laughs> um, I had arrived in, uh, J at, at JPL in Pasadena about two weeks before the Jupiter encounter. As you can imagine, we're, we're taking pictures as we go in, getting a lot of data. Uh, everybody's excited. We're, every, day, every day is getting better and better and better. So you arrive in a beehive and you're immediately put to work. Once that had subsided and we passed Jupiter, which is around July 6th, Ninth, I think, uh, things started to quiet down and I could be put to, onto my task. My task was actually to put together, um, uh, uh, what's the word for this, planning maps for the Saturn satellites. We hadn't been to Saturn yet, so we had another year and a half to get there. They wanted to make sure that the planned sequences that they had, we're going to take a picture then, we're going to take a, another picture you know, so many hours after that, Whole sequence. They wanted to get complete maps of the entire surfaces of all the major Saturnian satellites, and there's about six of them. So, in order to test that those sequences and make sure they had coverage, they had me design these maps that showed where the mapping coverage was going to be on a particular side of the planet or moon. Sorry. And uh, I had to draw, uh, you know, uh, get access to the high-powered graphing paper and rulers and protect, pro protectors of the day. Uh, we didn't need actually to use any high powered computers. This was uh, more than sufficient to, 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 to see what we needed to see. So what you see is basically uh, those polygonal outlines are where the mapping coverage was at that particular time. And you can see that it's partial coverage, it's okay. And then the one on the right is an actual uh, complete observation of, of, at one particular time. So it's quite amusing to actually see these diagrams, and then I can compare them to actual Voyager maps that were made 
And you know, they did a good job and, and, and everything was all worked out perfectly fine. It was an interesting introduction. Uh, but grabbing paper and ruler and protractor are still useful, just something to, for you teachers to remember. The other interesting aspect of being there was that there were s television monitors, and this is old style tube televisions, if you remember those, not solid state like they have today. They're about the size of, of this thing and about that deep as well because of the, uh, the electron tubes. And they were scattered throughout the lab. I mean, this, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory is about as big as the Rice Campus, maybe a little bit bigger than that. And they're like a couple dozen buildings. And each one of them had these monitors scattered all over the, the lab. And the project showed each image across the entire lab as it was downloaded from deep space. So everyone got a chance to see the image. And each day, you could see Jupiter getting a little bit bigger, and a little bit bigger, and a little bit bigger. And the detail, of course, would get more, more exquisite. And you could actually just ride along with the Voyager, uh, as it were, uh, during the course of the summer. And it's something I'll never forget. Now, when you get to the moons, you don't see the detail until the last day, because you, the resolving power isn't there. You need to actually get really up close before you can see the fractures and the craters and all that sort of stuff like that. And Voyager 1, because of its trajectory, did not see Europa, which is the second moon out. And if you know anything about space science, you know that Europa is pretty important. And I'll get to that in a bit. Uh, so Voyager 2, the big surprise, was Europa. What was Europa going to show us? The distant images were very fuzzy, showed only a few faint dark markings, looked like uh, one of Percival Lowell's maps of Mars. And then that image showed up on our monitor on the right, uh, and you know, our jaws sort of dropped open, and it's like, what the hell is this? Um, as this looks like no other surface we've seen in the solar system, even since then. And the other bodies that we've seen just don't look like this. It looks like a Jackson Pollock painting is what it looks like to me. Uh, so <coughs> we'll see this again later on. Uh, but that's, that, that tells you something about the experience of being there. Because I remember there were like a half a dozen of us in, in a small meeting. We were waiting. We knew when the downlink was going to happen because it's scheduled out. Because you have to allocate the DSN time and all that sort of stuff. So we knew when this was going to come down. We were sort of waiting. It's like, what is that? Um, so then, you know, the summer goes on. Anyway, we'll just let that play. Um, okay, so what you're seeing is uh, we're moving forward now in the Voyager sequence, because we've only got an hour from here, uh, to, uh, to Saturn, which was in November 1980. I'm sorry about that. I forgot that this was a, I borrowed this clip from uh, something I downloaded from the internet. Uh, you could do the same thing at Saturn as you did at Jupiter. Is to, you can take movies on the way in. And of course, at Saturn, the big thing is the rings. And people were blown away. They didn't really have a sense before we got there that the rings would be so complicated. You can see in the still version that it looks like a phonograph record. How many people remember what a phonograph record is? <laughs> it's a sheet of vinyl about this wide and it's got these lines all grooved in it with, which record the music in an analog format. It's like, okay, well, never mind. Um, uh, you can sort of see that on the CD around like this. But in any case, uh, thousands of, of spiral lines that look just like that. It's so dense in its pattern. Uh, but then, as you saw in the movie, there were these dark markings, broad dark markings that sort of swept around. It looks like somebody had drawn in crayon on the surface of the rings. People were just blown away at the complexity. And the rings, of course, are an experiment in gravitational physics. Because there are like those half dozen moons that I described, they're out beyond the ring system. But there's also uh, about an equal number of half a dozen or so smaller moons, which are about in the 10 to 100 kilometer size range, that orbit very close to the outer edge of the rings. Now, all these moons buzzing around on the outside have uh, serious gravitational perturbations on the individual ring particles, and they disturb them in, in wave-like patterns, and you can see those. 
and the Cassini mission that, that David mentioned did a much better job on all this uh, and, and was able to document all these uh, gravitational interactions in much greater detail than Voyager did. But Voyager revealed that was the key. Voyager said that there was something worth seeing out there. And uh, it was wonderful. Now, on the other body, you have smog covered, tit smog covered Titan. I'm not going to talk too much about this, although it's a pretty important body in its own. It's larger than the moon. It's about the size of the planet Mercury you saw. Yet, Voyager saw nothing. It saw just a tennis ball, a fuzzy orange tennis ball. Why? Because it's covered in smog. How many people have ever been to L.A.? <laughs> LA has actually gotten a lot better, but actually in the late 70s, early 80s, it was still routine to see or not see the San Gabriel Mountains, which hover over the JPL site because of the smog. It's a lot better now. Usually I, I rarely see that now whenever I visit. But in those days, it was still a problem. But Titan is just covered in it. You can't see it at optical wavelengths. At infrared, infrared wavelengths, you can actually see through the smog. And of course, radar will just will pass right through it. So Cassini uh, carried a radar instrument, and I probably should have had some slides in here showing some of the exotic terrains, but I wanted to focus on Voyager. And they, they see lakes, and they see streams, and they see all sorts of things on Titan, which indicate precipitation is going on, or has been, except in this case it's not water. It's a methane cycle. So methane gets converted to ethane, and the ethane precipitates, and it creates channels. Uh, Intermittent, it's, it's kind of like dry valleys in, in uh, the deserts of California. You get occasional uh, thunderstorms once or twice a summer, and then the rest of the time it's dry. So it's kind of like that. Uh, but in terms of organic chemistry, Titan is one of the key places. Voyager uh, got our first window into that because it had an infrared detector that was actually able to measure the abundances of these organic compounds for the first time uh, in a reliable way. And it told us, again, Titan is a key place we need to go to. And after that, uh, the impetus was to de design Cassini and go. So uh, we have two more bodies that are of interest to us uh, on the Voyager story. And the second is Uranus. And January 1986 was important for more than one reason. Those of you who are old enough uh, will remember that reason. Uh, four days after the encounter was when Challenger was destroyed. Uh, I do remember that because I couldn't go to the encounter and I turned on the TV to see what the latest uh, Uranus uh, results were from the press conference the day before and I woke up to Challenger. Uh, so those of us who were around remember that very well. But Uranus was a surprise in many levels. One was that Uranus was, was almost as bland as Titan was we couldn't see any storms. Uh, part of that was because Voyager didn't have any infrared uh, filters in the camera. Also, it's because it's kind of hazy. And it was also southern in summer. Uh, the sun was almost directly over the southern pole. Uh, Hubble Space Telescope has seen clouds since then. So we do know they exist. But the big surprise uh, was, first of all, we knew that there were rings. And so we got uh, some good ring images. Uh, they're very much thinner. Uh, almost like, like nine individual strands. There's also some dust in the system, but it's nothing like the complexity of the Saturn system. It's still an important uh, variation on the ring theme. But the key, the biggest surprise at Uranus was the complexity of the icy moons. Again, it was kind of surprising we were surprised because at Jupiter and Saturn we saw interesting icy moons that they were complex and geological, so we shouldn't have been surprised, and yet we were. So it's kind of, we were still learning the lesson, as it were. So the, those are the five uh, large moons of Saturn, uh, Uranus, and to keep, give you a sense of scale, the largest one is about the size of Texas. So we're not talking moon size here, we're talking somewhat smaller. So to have this kind of activity, geologic complexity on, a, on a, something that should be frozen solid and quiet you know, is, is, is part of the big puzzle that, that Voyager unlocked for us. Uh, so there's that. Uh, let's see, I same thing here. It's because I have the sound on for my last set of slides. Spots, uh, are in fact huge hurricane like storm systems. 
Okay, so what you've seen here is a set of, uh, again, time-lapse movies that Voyager took on its approach to Neptune. You can see some of the swirling cloud motions that are different, again, than what we saw at Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, you don't have these uh, turbulent eddies and stuff like that. You have this large dark spot which sort of moves around like a giant slug almost. And then these bright streaks of, of light, uh, uh, bright uh, high clouds. Again, a different uh, planetary environment that we're seeing at Neptune. And in this case, uh, Neptune and Uranus are different from the, uh, the larger uh, Saturn and Jupiter in that they have more uh, methane and uh, ammonia in their clouds, which give them the blue color. Uh, but they're so far from the sun that they don't get a lot of sunlight. So what's going on here is that there's, the turbulence is different, the atmospheric patterns are different. Now, I'm not an atmospheric scientist, so I'm not going to try to explain it. But you saw some of that here. This was in August 1989, and at that point I was actually working at JPL uh, as, as a postdoctoral scientist. Uh, and all of our friends uh, and my colleagues were all gathered at JPL to witness the encounter, and it was like a reunion. It was a very special time. There was a lot of nostalgia there. It was a lot of um, uh, probably a few tears, I think, uh, because I knew that this was sort of the end for Voyager. It wasn't really the end, but it was the end of the prime mission. It was the end of the four uh, planets that we were targeted to, to encounter. Uh, it's interesting to note that uh, shortly after this, within a few months, uh, several of our colleagues had gathered and started planning how are we going to get to Pluto? How are we going to finish the Voyager mission? And it took uh, a full decade for that mission to actually get approved by NASA and get selected. But it started right after Voyager 2 and Neptune. Now, this, the other uh, uh, fun thing about Neptune is that Neptune has a large moon. It's called Triton. It's ice covered just like the other satellites, except this one's different. It's got uh, uh, frozen nitrogen on the surface, it's got frozen methane, it's got frozen carbon dioxide. Uh, all these, of course, are gases here on Earth, but the surface temperature of Triton is about 35 Kelvin, so all these gases freeze out onto the surface and form part of the bedrock. And this is a map that we made at the LPI based on the latest map. Uh, my work in this, in this case, uh, reassembling the Voyager collection to make a new map. And basically what this video is, it's, it's a simulation of the Voyager encounter. Voyager passed uh, like right over within 3,000 kilometers of the North Pole of Neptune, and it did a dive like this and, and passed by Triton on its way out. So Triton was the last uh, solid piece of the solar system that Voyager saw. And uh, when they presented these results to the public, uh, the quote was, what a way to leave the solar system, and I can agree with that. So it was pretty cool. And some of you may remember that, and this was one of Carl Sagan's uh, projects, was that Voyager had a unique perspective at that point. Uh, I believe this was Voyager 1, which is up above the plane of the solar system. Uh, long past Saturn, was that this is the first time we had a real camera out at the edge of the solar system. Why not take a picture of the solar system? Well, that's not so easy. <laughs> to do that would have required several hundred pictures to do a complete you know, X, Y, Z mosaic. So what they did in order to get the pictures down and take them was to photograph them in this pattern, knowing where the plants were at the time, and leave the rest of it blank, because you know, you're just going to see nothing. Uh, it didn't have a sensitivity to see anything more than the brightest stars anyway. Uh, and you can see you know, the, the small little boxes show the insects. And this is the origin of the pale blue dot reference to the Earth. Because in these images, the Earth appeared blue. Uh, not only because of the water, obviously. Uh, but it was just a dot, one or two pixels wide. It was not very large at all, of course, at that distance. So it was a very famous photograph. It was the last set of photographs that Voyager took. The mission is not over. Uh, this diagram shows the approximate current positions of the two Voyagers and the two Pioneers. They're all headed out to the uh, deep space. We've lost contact with 
both Pioneers, mainly because the power ran out. The uh, isotope generators uh, were, were of limited uh, capability, so the power ran out after 20 years of, maybe it was about, yeah, about 20 years actually, that they ran out, didn't have enough power to run the antenna. Uh, but Voyagers are still running strong. And uh, this diagram is probably a little out of date because Voyager, either one or two, I don't remember which, have actually passed the orange boundary and are now uh, into uh, the beginnings of what we would call intergalactic space in terms of particle physics and that sort of thing, the edge of the solar influence. The Voyager mission ends sometime in the next decade when the power is basically runs out and can't run the uh, transmitters. Uh, basically, it's running only a few instruments at any given time to measure the particle and radiation fields. Uh, and in about 40,000 years, if, if you set your watches, you can uh, note the passage of Voyager 1 as it passes these reference stars. Those of you who are astronomers may recognize some of these names, Ross 248, I think, in particular. And I think in about 100, maybe it's 200,000 years, I think, Voyager 2 passes within a light year or so of Sirius. And those of you who are astronomers will recognize Sirius as the dog star, uh, the brightest star in the sky. So it actually will not pass too far from it. Whether anybody will notice, I don't know. So having told you the Voyager story, we can quickly take a look at what we've learned from Voyager. Again, this is the slide I showed earlier. It's the telescopic pre-Voyager photograph of Jupiter, and this is one of the Voyager images, and, I'm sorry, movies of Jupiter, and it's worth playing again after it, it repeats. Um, watch the southern edge of the Great Red Spot, how it sort of eats and then burps out these blobs of clouds as it rotates. Uh, and, and the upper cloud decks, as they swirl around at different rates, shearing up past each other, there's so much dynamics going on here to take uh, decades, and has taken decades to figure out what's going on. In fact, they had to launch a new mission to actually figure out why these patterns look the way they do. These are representative uh, images of the four giant planets that uh, Voyager visited. Uh, and again, they learned so much about the magnetic fields. You have to go there to actually measure the magnetic field. And I'm, I've got a slide later on that shows it, but the magnetic fields of both Neptune and Uranus are tilted like about 45 to 90 degrees from the rotational axis. So the, the rotational field is actually doing this as the planet rotates. Ours is pretty close to, to the <coughs> axis of the rotation. So nobody really understands why they do that, except probably that the magnetic field is generated closer to the surface than it is on the Earth. The magnetic field of Earth is generated in the core, really close to the center. And then, of course, the ring systems on all four of the bodies have ring systems. Voyager discovered the ring system of Jupiter. Uh, the Uranian and Saturnian ones were known before then. Uh, it was suspected at Neptune, but Voyager confirmed that, in fact, there is a complex ring system there. Again, this is the pre-Voyager view of the icy satellites. And this is what Voyager saw. And just the, 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 the thing I want you to take away from this is the incredible complexity diversity of these bodies. They're all mostly dominated by water ice with an admixture of some other ices depending on their position relative to the planet and to the sun. The ones further out have a lot more of the exotic ices, the methanes and the nitrogens and the carbon dioxides, whereas the inner ones are more dominated by water ice. But they're incredibly complicated. And Voyager hinted at something that was actually pretty important. And it turned out to be much more important when we returned to those systems. Europa, which is the image that's on the left-hand side, has this, again, this Jackson Pollock-like textures on it. <coughs> and we suspected, but Voyager didn't have the instrumentation. It didn't get close enough to really tell us, uh, is there an ocean underneath the surface of this ice shell? It's 100 degrees Kelvin, which is about minus 170 degrees Fahrenheit, something like that. And so it's, it's, very, it's very frozen on the surface, but it's warm enough, theoretically, to be liquid underneath, which means there would be liquid water, uh, a vast body of liquid water underneath the frozen ice shell. 
Voyager couldn't confirm it, but when we went back with the Galileo orbiter, orbiting around Jupiter, it could pass within 50 to 100 kilometers of, Ju of, of, of Europa and the other satellites as well, including Ganymede, and measure the magnetic field distortions. And that was the key. Getting that close with the, with the new spacecraft, you could actually measure the distortion and determine that it was generated from inside Europa and inside Ganymede and not Jupiter, which meant that there's something generating those magnetic dis distortions and the only thing that that can conduct uh, uh, in that way is, is liquid water. Also, the fact that the surface is almost crater-free. The surface is probably less than 100 million years old. Voyager determined that pretty reliably. So there, that was our first clue. That something that's only 100 million years old. The Earth is about 4.5 billion years old. So is Mars and the rest of the planets. But that kind of young surface has to be continually renewed by something. So there's a lot of activity, a lot of heat inside the rubber. What are the patterns that are important? I mean, what form of those patterns have Fractures. The, the, when you look up close at Europa, it's just densely covered with fractures that crisscross like, like a ball of twine almost, is what it looks like. But it's actually cracks in the surface that are split. In some cases, liquid's coming up from below and creating deposits. So that's what creates the orange material, for example. Um, but when you get up close, it's like just, it's just cross-cutting fractures everywhere. It's just everywhere it's cracked. Now on the bottom side, you see Enceladus, uh, which is an internal diagram, a cutaway diagram on the inside. And you can see, if you look closely, there's something jutting out of the South Pole. Voyager hinted that this was also a young surface, but it didn't get close enough and it didn't have the right filters and it didn't have the right viewing geometry to tell us what was actually happening. It hinted that something was different about Enceladus. Most of the other satellites of Saturn, for example, are just densely covered in craters. But Enceladus is, is much younger and it's got these strange patterns. When we went back with Cassini, we actually observed venting out of the South Pole. There was active volcanoes also in Enceladus. We needed to go back. Voyager hinted that something was different. But the Cassini mission told us what was actually going on. Triton, which you saw in the movie where we flew past just a few minutes ago, the red marking is an actual erupting volcano on Triton as well. We haven't been back to the Neptune system, but we suspect that Triton is geologically active, uh, a very young surface, even younger than Europa. So it could have an ocean on it. So Voyager uh, strongly hinted that uh, something different was happening in the outer solar system. And when we returned with Galileo and Cassini, we confirmed that. The finding is that uh, ocean worlds are probably a very common occurrence. We used to think of Earth as being the ocean world, the only one that had any water on, on it in, in a liquid sense. But all these examples, and there are others, uh, Callisto, for example, probably has an ocean deep inside. Titan probably has one as well, deep, uh, but probably has one. So there's like half a dozen worlds and possibly some other ones uh, that may have had them in the past, frozen now, that says oceans are very common. And that's important because on Earth, water and life are associated with each other. We need water to live. Water is probably where some of the life that we have developed, although there are certain um, uh, differences of opinion on where it actually originated. Uh, so we want to look at those oceans, and this the diagram shows two possible interpretations of what's going on underneath the surface of Europa. Uh, one is that the ice shell is thin, the other is that the ice shell is pretty thick, uh, and that there's all sorts of activity that could actually be uh, eruptions of volcanoes on the seafloor, like we have on Earth. Uh, on Earth, we have uh, the seafloor volcanoes, but we also have um, what they call black smokers, which is basically hydrothermal hot water that's actually penetrated through the crust and is uh, moved by the heat of the volcanoes and, and comes up black because it's, it's uh, exalving materials from the crust itself and bringing those out into the ocean water. So that you can have potentially complicated geochemical and geophysical systems uh, underneath these oceans 
But there's no way to, for us to know that because we can't explore them yet. Not, not in that sense. We would need a submarine. And getting through an ice shell that's 10 kilometers thick is a bit of a challenge, if you can imagine that. Um, but there are indirect ways we can do that with orbiters uh, that go in and measure the gravitational field and look for signatures of volcanism, that sort of thing. Uh, we actually don't know the chemistry of the oceans because we've never sampled it. On Enceladus, uh, and it, those vents, uh, those uh, jets coming out of the South Pole are actually composed of water and salt. Uh, and the reason we know that is because Cassini, because it could go back to Enceladus repeatedly, uh, was actually able to go right through the plumes, right through the jets, about 50 kilometers above the surface, and sample them with their uh, neutron mass spectrometer, which the only way knows what that is. Um, uh, I could actually measure the uh, materials that were in them. Uh, we would need to go back to, to Europa to do that again, if, if there were any there. So, uh, one last question you might ask is why is this, any of this happening? Ice should be frozen, right? <laughs> there shouldn't be much happening, right? And the further out from the sun, the less solar heating, things should be colder, and indeed they are colder as you go further out. And this movie illustrates the concept. On Earth we have a tide, and the moon generates it uh, as it goes around its orbit, and also by the sun. Uh, the sun does the same sort of thing. On Jupiter, uh, Jupiter is much larger than the Earth, can, and the, uh, the result is that the tides on the Jovian moods are much higher and much stronger than they are on Earth. For example, on Europa, if you were standing on the surface of Europa, the surface would go up and down with each tide, which is uh, about a three-day period on Europa, 30 feet. And I'm talking about actual solid surface would actually lift up and down in response to the gravitational tide of, of Jupiter. The reason for that is because the orbit of Europa is not circular, it's elliptical. So it gets closer uh, and further away every 3.14 days or whatever it is, uh, 3.5 days. Uh, that raises a 30 meter, I said feet, it should be 30 meter tide every single day. That amount of flexing introduces a lot of heat into the shell, the icy shell of Europa. It's enough to keep it liquid. It actually melts it. On Io, it's a silicate body made of basalts, dominantly, and some other materials. And that tide is enough to melt the rock itself. It's, it, that's because Io is much closer in. So, uh, NASA has set, as a result of the Voyager findings and the Galileo and Cassini findings, that ocean worlds are an exploration priority. And we want to go back there. And in fact, we are planning a mission, as you see on the right-hand slide, uh, to return to Europa. Uh, launch date is currently set around 2023, depending on the availability of the launch vehicle. It'll take uh, roughly six years to get there. So late in the next decade, we'll have an orbiting mission around Jupiter that will pass by Europa many times and globally map the surface and do radar sounding and gravitational measurements and infrared measurements and a whole bunch of things trying to determine what the chemistry of the surface is and what's going on in terms of the ocean. One of the things we actually hope to determine is whether Europa is actively erupting any material from the ocean today. Neither Voyager or Galileo were able to determine that. So well, that's one of the things we want to determine. Now, um, that's basically the end of the talk, except uh, I don't know if we have five minutes. OK. So um, since this is the 40th anniversary, we can talk a little bit about the feelings and perspectives of the team that was launching Voyager at the time of the mission development. And they knew that this would not, they were not the first man-made objects to leave the solar system. The pioneers were, were to do that. Uh, so they were going to try to do something different. So they wanted to send a message from the people of Earth to whoever might, Klingons or whatever, might, um, <laughs> uh, might encounter the spacecraft 20,000 20, years, 50,000 years, or whatever, or people from Earth who might want to look at the time capsule, although we actually have copies of it. 
so it doesn't make any sense. But anyway, um, so they just they put together a record, and this is the record and its covering, which is made of gold, which gold is supposed to be a stable metal, so it wouldn't decay in space uh, from radiation, that sort of stuff. And they recorded the sounds of Earth. In fact, I was attending, uh, I was part of a concert uh, about four weeks ago from a local um, chamber orchestra who decided to actually play some of this music uh, as part of their show. One of the unexpected surprises of the Voyager mission was that when we sent uh, the <coughs> sounds of the people of Earth to space, we got something else uh, back. We got, uh, in fact, the sounds of the, of the planets. Now, you might scratch your head and say, you can't hear sound in outer space. Of course, that doesn't make any sense. So matter is needed to do that. You know, sound is transmitted in water and in air. But space is actually, well, I shouldn't say it's full, but it does have plasma, which is an extremely tenuous, thin, unbreathable, because it's simply so low in density, envelope of particles uh, outflowing from the sun and surrounding the planets trapped in the radiation belts. So, I think I skipped ahead of this slide. Oh, yeah, I did. So, um, that's a teaser, by the way. Um, so, this plasma is constantly in motion, responding to the solar wind. So, it moves in and out, and it's denser in some areas, and it flows, and it bounces around, and moves around. It's all being pushed around, uh, creating waves in the, in the plasma. And again, this is so low in density, you can move your hand through it, and you wouldn't know it. Uh, let alone not breathe. These waves are measured by instruments on Voyager and subsequent spacecraft. And this is a, a diagram showing the, the measurements that are made, and you can see there are variations in them. And they all have different signatures associated with different phenomena. Either lightning strikes on the planet can be recorded, or uh, other factors, uh, the, the shock when it, the solar wind hits the, the radiation field, for example. These can all be transcribed into audio frequencies, and that's what you heard in the, in the next slide, is the attempt to do that. And I'll let this play for a few moments because you'll see that actually will ramp up and you'll hit the, basically, the, the outer boundary of the Jovian magnetic field. Uh, the slide, the movie on the left is actually Uranus. I mentioned that earlier. Uranus. Should change in a minute. Yeah, okay, you're hitting this point right there. So you're actually hearing the penetration of the Jovian magnetic field, which is much more powerful than the Earth's. Probably the most amusing one, and this is the, the last one is that you can actually hear the Saturnian rings. And the way you can hear them is, is that most of the rings, especially in the outer areas where Voyager went, Voyager didn't go through the rings, that would have killed the spacecraft and destroyed them. It went as far away as it could and still do science. Yet there's still dust, it's a very dusty plane. When the micron-sized particles, which are smaller than the dust particles that we clean up in our own home, strike the spacecraft. They, they, they basically are destroyed in a burst of plasma, of ionized gas, around the inside of the impact, and the instruments pick that up. And there are thousands of these, thousands of these impacts. I don't have any control over them. Not. Sorry. They sound like rain, because they're happening so fast. Thousands of small dust-sized particles. It sounds like rain on a tin roof. Uh, which is very different from the sounds we heard just a few minutes ago. Okay. Uh, I'm going to skip over that one and say thank you. Time for a few questions, but I'm going to stick around for for at least 15 minutes to answer any questions that you might have. And we don't have the usual handheld mic, so if you wouldn't mind speaking up, and, and Paul, if you don't mind repeating the question for everyone, that'd be great. Huh? How, do you know, how do you know if you 
got the end of the solar system and you started, you, when you, you detected the edge, were you just prior to that inside the magnetic field of the sun? Is that the last detection? Did it, did it change the orientation of your magnetic detectors when you left that point? Yes. Um, we have a very good characterization of the solar wind, which is the particles just bursting out of the sun in, in the radial directions. So we know that signature very well. And there's a number of indicators, and in I, I know nothing about plasma or magnetic fields or anything. I'm a geologist. I know rocks. That's all I know. So, um, uh, so there's directional indicators uh, associated with that outflow and intensity indicators. And when it slows, basically it's slowed to a halt almost at the edge of the solar bubble, which is roughly about 120 astronomical units, something like that, which an astronomical unit is the or Earth's orbital distance. Uh, so it's quite a distance. Out. All those indicators were changing, flipping around, and the intensity changed, the directions changed, everything changed. Um, and, and, and so, so they knew something was happening, and then it transitions into another. Um, the transition zone is not instantaneous. It doesn't happen like this. It's like hundreds, several hundred thousand miles wide zone where, this, where, the, where the particles from the sun are sort of break to a halt, and then you get this, these other currents and other things which I don't understand or anything like that. And then you transition into the streaming plasma environment of galactic space, whatever that is. Who knows? So that's the best answer I can get on that one. But yeah, there's, all, all the instrumental indicators changed. There was a, there was a, there was a different composition in the particles. The way yes, that as well. Oh yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The, definitely the helium and, and hydrogen coming so out of the sun. Some people still argue that we're not quite left yet, though, right? That's oh yeah, I mean these, these guys are the people who know something about that. No, no, there's people still arguing that we haven't left the solar the, the, because it's a we're, tough thing. We're in the transition zone for sure right. because things have definitely changed. Right here. I'm wondering if the uh, bottom of the ocean, you know, the heat flux escaping in Europa, right? We don't know. Yeah, the, the, que the question is, uh, relates to uh, whether we, I guess, whether we know what's going on in the f ocean floor of Europa and whether there's enough heat there. And we don't know. There's a lot of speculation. Scientists like to speculate sometimes. Um, uh, there's enough heat to, of course, keep the liquid, uh, the, the water ocean, the water liquid. Uh, whether there's enough to uh, trigger, like, active volcanoes like, like Iceland or something like that on the floor is, is problematic. Uh, but there's probably a good chance that there's enough to circulate water through cracks or fissures in the ocean floor of Europa that would circulate water in where it would be warmer and then move the chemistry around, circulate the chemistry. And that's what you want, really. You don't have to have, you know, erupting volcanoes like Circe or something like that, but you need some circulation uh, uh, to, to create some interesting chemistry. And, you know, since we can't, we've only seen the surface, we can speculate and, and try to do some geophysical observations with the next mission. Uh, well, we have an example of just that. Uh, Voyager was designed in 19, the mid 1970s, uh, so it uses uh, doesn't use CCDs. It uses Viticon cameras, which are equivalent to the old tube style television cameras. Um, uh, we launched New Horizons to Pluto in 2006. And that was designed in 2004, 2003 time period. And it was smaller, the budget was less, the antenna was smaller, and we can only put four instruments as opposed to 11 instruments on board. Uh, the television camera was much more powerful. Uh, we knew, th th this is where um, the experience of Voyager plays into what happens next, is that we found that these ices are very colorful. And so we had a much more powerful uh, multi-spectral camera, and we had a very powerful 
infrared mapping spectrometer, which is a fancy name for an imager that looks at the far inf mid infrared wavelengths. Uh, and there, I kind of wish I had a picture of Pluto in this presentation now. Um, we, as a result, we've been able to map the distributions of exactly where the nitrogen ices are, where the methane ices are, where the carbon dioxide ices are, and where the water ice is on Pluto. And that's important for us to see where, how the geology developed and why it's there and why it's not in other locations. Uh, what's the geologic history of Pluto? So that's the partial answer is that um, it's the instrumentation. It's the science instrumentation. We knew that you had to go into the infrared. We didn't know that with Voyager, but now it's key. We have to do that to, because that's where these ices are spectrally done. Um, there are other factors. Pluto has an atmosphere, so we wanted to take an ultraviolet spectrometer along to see what the atmospheric composition was. Uh, Voyager had that too because it was used it on the planets. Here we used it on Pluto. So um, we, didn't take, uh, we didn't take a magnetometer on board uh, because we were somewhat limited in, in various factors, mass, money, a whole bunch of things. Um, and we really didn't get close enough to get a good magnetic field signature, but you can't do everything on the first mission. Anyway. So, and there's more to that question than I could tell you, but that's, those are the key things that come to my, my mind. Thank you. Me. Uh, yeah, after uh, just uh, thinking for a second about the, the, uh, the, uh, the 40,000 years for this man made spacecraft to get to a star, I first thought it was 40,000 years. That's not very long. Not really. And uh, then, I, of course, uh, in my head, I can't really, long I can't really uh, do the math fast enough on, you know, on, uh, comparing light years with the speed of the spacecraft. But, but you know, I mean, if you're getting to a star within uh, 40,000 years, uh, that's, that's something pretty special. I mean, the, the, the business of the record on there, you know. Oh, yeah. I want to point out, you know, Chuck Berry is on that record. Yeah, yeah, and he yeah, actually... And I did hear that the, somebody uh, at JPL got a report back to send, send more Berry <laughs> yeah, Ch Chuck, Chuck Berry actually performed uh, at JPL the day after the encounter in the mall. Uh, JPL has a grass mall. He performed there for us, and I think he's saying uh, Voyager be good or something like that. But um, uh, the, the velocity, the outward velocity of the, the two Voyagers is on the roughly order of 15 kilometers per second. And it will not pass within those star systems. It will pass a few light years from them. That's why they're on the list. Is that's the closest pass we had. So anybody who's looking for them would have to be looking for uh, an object uh, that would basically fit from here to the first rows. Um, out, you know, two or three light years, which is a long way away <laughs> for us. It's a long way away. A um, couple of trillion miles or something like that. Um, and we'd have to be looking for it. So, yeah, chances of it being found are remote. <laughs> so this is where, so if you think about that 40,000 miles an hour, right, so that's a pretty fast speed. Right? Even, yeah, a yeah. even a Tesla can do that, right? Yeah, well, that, 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 that's... It's been traveling for 40 years and only recently got outside of our little part of the galaxy. So this is, this is uh, just this whole scale is just well, that's like from here. That's here to the airport in one right. second. Or right. you know, something like that. To be honest, very fast. The, the speed uh, of, the, of the instrument is constant, obviously, after it, after it leaves the solar system. But it was not constant when it. I mean, when it was zipping around, or uh, I mean, it, it changed the speed. Right? Yes. Yes. And, and, and every time it passed the planet, it got a boost. In speed, it actually is slowly decaying because of the gravitational influence of the sun, but it's minuscule de decrease in velocity. Uh, I, 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 that's a, I, it reminds me of a story. Um, Voyager got a boost. I don't remember what the boost was in velocity. It was substantial in terms of its approach versus its uh, departure velocity when it encountered Jupiter and then from Saturn. But Jupiter actually decreased in its velocity. 
so that in roughly a million years, it will be about a centimeter short of where it would have been if Voyager hadn't passed by. <laughs> so we're doing a lot of damage out there. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's true. That, that is actually true. There has to be a momentum exchange. So Jupiter actually lost, uh, you know, trivial. It's a trivial the conservation amount, but, of, uh, yeah. of energy. Yeah. I forgot that story. Um, I'm not sure how I could repeat that question for the monitor, but um, uh, you're, you're at, basically, I think the question is, can well, we tell anything? Does the composition of the salts, particularly if they're heavier salts compared to like sodium chloride or something, right. tell you anything about whether the interior is a solid core or not? In the fractures, for example, in the fractures in Europa, uh, which you mentioned are darker and have some higher molecular weight of organic compounds, do you see any In terms of the, um, the dark markings on Europa and their composition and whether they're telling us something about the interior, they're telling us something, but there's a bit of a debate right now. The, the Galileo detectors gave us sort of ambiguous results. They could be sulfates, uh, which would have a reddish color. They could be uh, salts, which are slightly different in composition. Those chemistries are more related probably to the ice-ocean Interface and the ice ocean combination on Europa is about a hundred kilometers thick, and then the rest of it's rocky silicates, hydrated silicates, maybe maybe an iron core. The only way to get at that information, what's in the interior, is to look at the gravity signature, uh, as Galileo or the new Europa mission will tell us. And there, it uh, clearly indicates that it's got uh, an icy watery outer layer, and then uh, the denser silicates on the inside. But it doesn't tell us what that composition is. The chemical interaction is probably only in the water uh, interface, unless there's something going on at the ocean bottom. But there, we're, again, entering into speculation. There's no way to know whether they're related or not. They could be. Uh, Stephen Hawking. So um, the question is basically Stephen Hawking's saying we only have 100 years to get off the planet before we're immolated, I guess, is, is the inference, I guess. I would suggest, based on current events, that we may have no more than a year. <laughs> but, um, 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 that, there's always been this drive to, to go and colonize Mars. It's an old dream. Uh, Mars is probably the only place that's practical, I guess. Um, you could do it on the moon, but it's airless and, you know, giant colonies with, you know, uh, greenhouses and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, maybe, but um, in terms of a drive to, to go, that's a political question, I think. Um, the People are always pushing, let's go to Mars, let's go to Mars. Yeah, and that's great. And, and, and maybe, but whether it will sustain an entire race, I don't know. That's not something I really think about very much myself. So there's, a, there's an interesting calculation that a colleague of mine gave to me, which kind of puts this in perspective. The Earth has 7 billion people on it. It's growing at 1% a year. So there's 70 million new people on the planet every year. If you want to keep the Earth where it is now, you have to take those 70 million people and send them somewhere <laughs> to somewhere that doesn't want them because Earth is the only place that can really sustain it. That's not very feasible, so at the very, at the very least. Um, but Jeff Bezos, who you've probably all heard of, right, especially if you did Cyber Monday, um, <laughs> with, with Blue Origin, one of his big goals about why he's investing his own money in the space uh, going, like, leaving the Earth and building rockets 
is not so much to take people off the earth, but it's to take all the stuff that is affecting the earth, the heavy industry, the mine, all the stuff. We still need that energy, we need those resources. Take that off planet, and then the earth becomes the place that sustains life without us messing with it. And so that's a kind of interesting idea, and there's a lot of discussions going around on that, but that's not a planetary science talk, that's more of a, a commercial space talk. So there's a lot of interesting things happening, and we may be driven there just because of <coughs> the inability of the Earth to sustain us. And as we learn more, I think, if you don't mind me sort of putting words in, in, the, in the Voyager mouth, is that is as we learn about how um, precious life is, even if there is liquid water and organic material on these other planets, there's nothing quite like us as far as we know. Um, at least we won't know for 40,000 years, right? <laughs> um, you know, we, we learn a lot from space to science that into some of these other arguments. That's, that's my soapbox. Yeah. Well, we, we can also look at what Voyager and the other, the entire NASA and Russian and other planetary exploration uh, programs have, have revealed about the solar system. And I'm reminded of a, a chapter title in an old book I read when I was a kid, No Hiding Place. There's no real place for us to go. Um, Mars could be sustainable, but it required developing its own infrastructure and you know, uh, to, to build structures that protect people because you can't breathe the atmosphere. There's an atmosphere. I mean, I love The Martian. I thought that was a great movie, but, you know, it's, that, that was not a sustainable <laughs> environment. That was a, that was a temporary exploration thing. So, You're yeah. Um, I actually am not familiar with those. Well, well, colonies, yeah. colonies in space. This is yeah. where I get to advertise the TV series The Expanse. Yeah, I, I, met the, I met one of the actors last weekend. And, uh, I like the thing in another interstellar, maybe. Anyway, yeah, any other? Yeah, so we have, um, let's go, will you work, let's, let's work, someone has, back here and then we'll work a little down the front here. So, uh, you talked about tidal, tidal, you said, that energy got to come from someplace, and is that going to be measurable with respect on the order of the planet that we have to assume the energy is coming from Yes, yes. Okay. Um, the question relates to or, uh, tidal heating and what its origins are, okay. uh, orbital of decay. Um, the orbits of the satellites evolve with time. They interact with each other. They're large objects, so they sort of sense each other. And uh, Europa, I'm sorry, Io, Europa, and Ganymede are actually in a resonance. Their orbits are uh, multiples of each other, uh, one, two, and four. Uh, so they actually are in the same position uh, each time the outer planet goes around. They're all on one side. So they're pulling each other out of round. The orbits are, out of, are not circular. Uh, so, so that's, the, that's the mechanical reason why there's tides, is that the gravitational inter interactions of the four satellites are pulling their orbits out of round. If the orbit's out of round, that means it gets closer by a significant fraction during part of its orbit. That means it gets closer and each time it gets closer, it gets distorted by the gravitational field. Jupiter is like, you know, 1,300 Earth masses or something, some large number like that. I can't remember the exact numbers. I never remember these things, but it's huge. So when it gets closer, it's going to distort. And that's where the 30 meter figure comes from. That's the distortion. It's because the orbit is forced to be out of round <coughs> and moves the satellite in closer during part of its orbit. And that generates a lot of frictional heating. The rock basically is, is, is doing this sort of thing all over the place. So that's what causes the heat. Now, I'm not sure that answers the question, though. When, every time that planet heats up, it's taking heat, it's taking energy from someone. Right. And the only source of the energy that I can see, unless I'm missing something, is the, is the orbit of is the, is the satellite going around Jupiter, which he says that the, planet, that the satellite can get closer and closer to Jupiter. That makes sense? Um, I'm trying to remember. I, I, I knew this at one point. There's an orbital, the, the, there's I think an orbital there energy associated with the system, and some of that energy gets modified by this. I think they're moving out. Energy changes. I, think, I think they're moving outward, but I might be wrong. I, I, my memory is not good on this particular point. I but I think they're moving out. There is a, there is a modification of the orbit. It's right, yeah. Your, your it is. 
the, the orbits are changing in dimensions. But the fact that they're in orbital resonance means that they're actually kind of locked in to some degree as well. They, they can't move very much at the present time. Jupiter is actually losing some energy as a result of this interaction as well. It's distorting Jupiter itself. So very minuscule. Well, um, I don't think it's... Yeah, Jupiter is contracting. That's a different problem. Because of century and that yeah. generates internal heat. Yeah. twice as much. Yeah, as that, that effect is minuscule compared to the, uh, the collapsing you know, shell of uh, Jupiter itself. So we have one, two, and three. So I think over there in the, right white, in the white shirt maybe? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Blue shirt and then we'll come back to that. Yeah. No, this right here first. Okay. And then, we'll and then we'll probably wrap it up. Oh. That, that's a long question, or long answer. How does New Horizons results of Pluto affect our interpretation of Pluto, uh, uh, Triton? Um, and I didn't talk about this, actually. Uh, so I'm going to try to give you the shortest answer possible, and we can follow up on it later if you want. But Triton is indeed a, a satellite of, of, of Neptune. It's in a very ascent, actually in a very circular but tilted retrograde. It's going backwards compared to what the other ones do in the other the rest of the solar system. That's almost exactly the same size, almost exactly the same density, and almost the exact same uh, surface composition as Pluto. But it got captured, we believe, by, tri uh, by Neptune some time ago, and in the circularization of the orbit, it basically got melted from the inside out. Uh, Pluto never experienced that. The surfaces of, and we were very interested in this idea on our approach to Pluto, was whether the two bodies would look alike or have shared um, characteristics. Uh, and again, the, the 30 second answer is that mostly Pluto doesn't look very much like Triton. Triton has been completely resurfaced. There's, there's no old terrains left on it. But Pluto is very much more complicated. There's a lot of old terrains, ancient terrains, let's say, and a couple of very young terrains that are basically frozen nitrogen ice sheets, composed of a couple of kilometers of frozen nitrogen, just a layer of it on the surface. Triton doesn't have that. So um, probably the reasons for those differences are that Triton would probably look like Pluto if it hadn't gone through this catastrophic capture sequence at, at Neptune, which melted the whole thing, basically. It just melted the entire body, at least the outer half of it, anyway. So that's the short answer. Last question. So is it possible to predict or anything else that matters from like Voyager or Horizons be used for uh, evidence for like a night planet? For what? A night planet. Oh, uh, some people say Pluto is a night planet. Um, the plasma waves? I don't know how that would... Um, the plasma waves are all uh, related to the uh, magnetic field and the radiation belts, primarily, that are trapped around the planets, much like our Van Allen belts around the Earth. If you did a similar mission through the Earth system with the same type of instruments, you could get the same type of plasma uh, audio or, or plasma wave signatures, which you can then translate to audio, of course. Uh, but Jupiter is much larger. Saturn has one, Uranus, Neptune. They all have these magnetic field signatures, or magnetic fields, which trap the radiation belts. And that's the primary thing that they're measuring. Is And then you get it with the solar wind as well, and, uh, a solar eruption, uh, a solar corona event would create a, a disturbance in that, and you'd get a similar wave pattern. But they're all localized to that planetary system. We're not really feeling anything that's way out in the outer solar, at, at the edge of the solar system. So that would not be the way to do it. Gravity waves, that's a different sort of thing. That might have something. If you would de I mean, de 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 detect a disturbance in the orbits of yeah. the planet. And nobody's really picked up anything that's measurable. I mean, it'd have to be big enough to have a magnetic field. The magnetic field would have to be strong enough to have an interaction so it produce the waves. Because if it's anything, it's twice as far away, I think, as, as Neptune. So that's a factor of four in yeah. our square and so on. But that's how one of the things we'll try to do is use that approach to see if we can determine if these exoplanet systems that are now being discovered have a magnetic field. So that if the planet is an air flight planet close to a sun like star, 
but it doesn't have a magnetic field, the surface isn't going to be very habitable for complex systems like us. And so one of the things we can do is predict what we might expect a signature to be with that interaction, and could we see that in the radio on some of those more and more so um, I think maybe just one last question, if it's a brief one. <coughs> Go back, please. Okay, so the question is how do we decide or how do we get a probe onto the surface of Europa, basically. And there are discussions about that going on right now. Europa, um, uh, to address the, the challenges that are inherent in going to the surface of Europa, it's about the size of the moon, so we can think of that, uh, but it has no atmosphere. You can't use a parachute like you do on Mars, to land on Mars, or Titan, for that matter. It's also bathed in the, in the strongest radiation belts that are in the solar system. Uh, so it's a very hostile place. Uh, you have to harden the electronics uh, to survive for a period of time. Uh, and it's also within the Jovian gravitational field. So even getting to Europa itself requires a large uh, fuel tank to, to break into orbit because there's no way to use a parachute, as I said. That makes it expensive. And expense drives what we can do <coughs> often in the case. But there is an impetus to go there because there is this uh, exotic, uncertain chemistry on the surface. There's the possibility of something from the ocean getting to the, to the surface and being something we could sample. So we would want to go there and actually see. What is the ocean made of if we can find a place where the ocean is erupting? Uh, which is why we have to go back and is to do the mapping first to determine as best we can what's on the surface, how did it get there, is there any indication of the exotic chemistry, and then go there if we can. That would be the uh, logical next step. And so there's a lot of trading, horse trading going on in terms of, well, what kind of instruments should we put on this lander and uh, how do we get it to the surface and make it affordable and, you know, because you can't do everything, you know, the more instruments you have, the heavier it is and the more expensive it is, that sort of thing. So you got to sort of figure out what is the key question and how are you going to address <coughs> it with the minimum amount of mass and it's just a little, little. Um, but there are, there are extensive di discussions going on right now to see whether it's feasible. I mean, um, our local congressman is, is behind most of that, actually. So the idea that the orbiting mission is going to give you more information is telling whether or not we should go to the surface. I think I think it's probably uh, safe to conclude that everybody in the in our, in our profession and a lot of people on the outside think that we should go to the surface. Okay. So that's not a difficult question. It's the question is, can it be uh, put into a a package that will, will not cause congressmen to choke. That gets you into other areas where I don't want to go right now. But, um, but yeah, yeah, they have, have to say, yes, it's worth doing, and we, we can afford this and justify it to the, to the people. Because it is the people's well, thank you, thank you, Thank you for all the questions.